Welcome back. Welcome back to the third session of Art of Environmental Justice in an Expanded Field. Uh, we will have three more presentations by visiting artists, and then uh, our moderator, Ann McClintock, will lead a discussion. And uh, thank you very much for staying with us in such a chilly room. Uh, we've been working with the building facilities people all day trying to adjust the temperature and uh, if anyone needs to borrow my jacket to stay warm, just raise your hand. Um, um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Sammy Baloji, a photographer and multimedia artist who lives in Brussels and Lubumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo. After studying information science and communications at the University of Lubumbashi, he worked as a cartoonist before taking up video art and photography in graduate studies at the Ecole Supérieure in Strasbourg. For the past decade, he has explored issues of urbanism and the social and environmental legacies of colonialism in his home province of Katanga, a once prosperous mining region in the DRC. With uncanny beauty and critical insight, his photographic work has often used montage to stage encounters between past and present, bodies and architectures as traces of social history, lost ideals, and lingering cultural tensions. His work has been acquired by major museums around the world and is regularly exhibited internationally. He just came here from uh, Documenta in Athens. His exhibition with anthropologist Philip de Beck titled Urban Now, City Life in Congo is currently on view at the Open Society Foundation in New York. He has also participated in a number of group exhibitions with environmental themes, including Environment and Object in Recent African Art, organized by the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, and Earth Matters, Land and material as metaphor, land and, excuse me, land as material and metaphor in the arts of Africa at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Among his many awards are the 2015 Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship and the 2014 Rolex Mentor and Protege Arts Initiative Award, partnering with Olafur Eliasson. Please welcome Sami Baloji. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Alain, for the invitation, and thank you to uh, all the uh, Princeton University for this, um, uh, for this occasion to talk about my work. Um, I used to speak French, and um, English is not my language. Uh, so I just um, write text that I can read, and, uh, and I think in the discussion it will be more quite clear, and we can discuss more. So. Uh, uh, I was born in uh, 1978 in Lubumbashi, the principal city of the Katanga region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This was uh, during the dictatorial reign of President Mobutu. I was 12 when the Berlin Wall fell, the Cold War ended, and as Congo opened up politically, chaos soon ensued. My adolescence was uh, shaken by the genocide in Rwanda and the wars in, West, in, Eastern, in Eastern Congo, which have lingered to the present day. My work uh, f focuses on the human in the context of social justice, on how the natural environment is issued, and who benefit from its exploitation. In my work, I have examined, I have exam, examined uh, who owns the land, who occupies it, who mines it, who controls the wildlife, who controls the means of production and the means of representation, and how do all these factors weave together. 
Among my uh, most recent work, for example, um, is a series of photographs of uh, the hereditary land chiefs of Kinshasa, the capital of DRC. Chiefly, authority has been uh, sidelined by forces of modernity, both colonial and post-colonial, including pressure of urbanization and global mining interest. This work, uh, um, these works are currently uh, on exhibition in Manhattan at the Urban Society Foundation. They are part of the larger project examining urban environment called Urban Now, City Life in Congo, a project I did in conjunction with anthropologist Philippe de Bouc. One focus uh, on, of my interest in the Congolese worker as a nucleus of the family who, since the earliest exchange with the West in the uh, 14th century, has continually been abused in the slave trade and in the intensive production of rubber, cotton, copper, uranium, cobalt, and coltan, all derived from the natural environmental core of Congo within a, a structure of unfair trade relations. I draw on memory and the archive to outline the historical depth of my themes. I'm interested in universalizing these themes to the global level so that we can view the neglected contribution of the Congo to international networks of trade as a, as a microcosm and trace related ramifications in other contexts or environment. Uh, environment. The country was uh, born from the desire to exploit. In 1884, Bismarck uh, convened the Berlin Conference, attended by 14 European states, in order to reach an amicable agreement for the partition of Africans among them. Leopold II, king of the Belgium was granted in his personal capacity a territory of more than 900,000 square miles. This became the Congo Free State. Over, over which Leopold ruled from 1885 to 90, uh, 90, 98. The Congo Free State was conceived as a space of free exchange of commodity. It permitted horrible abuses committed on Congolese subjects who were forced to deliver quotas of rubber and ivory to meet world demand. Corporate punishment, in including amputations of hands or feet, incentivized production. Effecti effectively, the Belgian House of Rep Rep Representatives provide the following figures for the increased production of rubber. In 1887, 30 tons. In 1903, it was um, 5,900 tons. Also between 1884 and uh, 1904, King Leopold's Congo Free State sold more than 8 million pounds of ivory. That means like more than uh, two, um, 200 thousand um, elephants died, but many more people died. King Leopold of Belgium was responsible for the death and mutilation of million Congolese Africans during the late 19th, and, uh, 19th century. Leopold abuses eventually forced the Belgian government to take control and it ruled what became called the Belgian Congo from uh, 1998 to 1960. During the 52 years of colonial rule, the Belgian Congo was managed from Brussels. And during the colonial era, the Belgian rulers of what was then known as the Belgian Congo industrialized Congolese copper mining. Of course, Congolese labor and copper were exploited in this process but it is also pro uh, produced many benefits. The mining company provided good pay, education, and health services. It was 
as people in Katanga still recall the beautiful time. And this was the title of my first solo museum, uh, my first solo museum show in New York at the Museum for African Art and the accompanying book. My series memoir thematize, thematizes the historical background of this memory of a more beautiful time recalled today in a time of post-colonial ruin, collapse, and corruption. In the memoir photomontage, I juxtaposed the photographic archives of the mine with my own photograph to present the exploitation of the local workforce during the colonial period, collaged and on top of my own evidence of the decadence produced by the DRC's economic crisis, in turn created by the corruption of Congolese politicians and the, and in the post-colonial era. Likewise, the work in the video is focused on the politic of broken promises in different periods of post-colonial history. So uh, I think for this, um, my relation with uh, archives explains that during the, 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 I mean, during the dictatorial period, I wasn't, uh, when I went to school, I didn't uh, learn anything about the colonial period. And it's mainly because um, we were going through a dictatorial period with Mobutu, uh, and he started to talk about a kind of retour à l'authenticité means going back to authenticity. So it was a mix of um, modern and traditional way of uh, ruling the, 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 the country, but in a, a quite dictatorial way. So in that way, it was not really interesting to talk about the Belgian um, uh, history or the colonization itself, because he, he wanted to uh, create a kind of uh, dignity or uh, also uh, a, a new identity of people through his way of uh, ruling the city, uh, ruling the country in a way. So uh, when I started to work as a, I mean in, 19, in 1990, where it was a crisis, it was a crisis period, I started to work, uh, I was 12 years old, and um, I, I finished my, we, we went through a crisis for seven years, more than seven uh, years, uh, and even when Kabila, the father, came to the to the power, it was in 97. But anyway, when I finished my, uh, my studies in 2000, I started to uh, do photography and working for the uh, French Cultural Center as a photographer. And then um, with the director of, of the, the, the French Cultural um, Institute, we started to work on the architecture and al also on the, um, the colonial heritage in order just to promote also all those buildings who were um, uh, be, who were going to be destroyed in, in, in the city. So the, the, the idea was to document those building, but even those uh, mining uh, area. And this is the way that I discover uh, uh, also those archives, uh, and those archives that has, uh, was part of the, the, um, the colonial past. And I, and I started to, in a way, those uh, photo montage for me, it's a kind of uh, connection between uh, what have been hidden in a way and, and what have been forgotten or in a way, because I think it's uh, it's a kind of trauma in a way, and, don't, and people do, doesn't don't want or my father or grandparent don't want to pick uh, to, to talk about it, and I found it's really interesting in a way to to uh, to connect with this past in order to criticize, and even in order to just think how this the uh, why and how the city was created and how to create a new identity through all, all, all this trauma in, in a way. So um, one of the work that I did uh, um, in, um, at the Venice Biennale uh, in 2015, it was the Adam Memorial, where I started also to think about the pre-colonial period and in order just to find, to go over the, 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 the colonial period in order to connect with um, the knowledge of my ancestors and, and how those, those uh, community were uh, ruling themselves before the encounters with uh, Western, in a way. So I started to uh, work, I mean, to, to um, one of the traces that I found was really interesting 
is the, those uh, marks of scarifications that were done on, on bodies in, in order to ident identify uh, communities. But it's, also, it's a political way of uh, assuming uh, a community and belonging to a community to a kind of aesthetic and a space in the environment. So um, I, found it really, uh, I found it really interesting to, because uh, I mean, the scarification was erased during the colonial period because uh, it was not allowed at all uh, with the Belgian. So, uh, and, uh, and this heritage ne has never been uh, arrived to my generation anymore. So uh, for me, going back to this heritage is uh, a way of trying to connect with uh, this past. So I started to work with those scarification and putting them on a copa why copper? Because copper was, uh, I mean, uh, exploited even before the, the colonial period, even during the pre-colonial uh, period. The copper was exploited in, in, in my country, and uh, and then after a week, uh, during the colonial period, the copper, even uranium and cobalt, was something really interesting for the economical interest of the colonial uh, of the Western uh, and. Uh, and I think there is a link between, and it's, and it's still ongoing, the interest of, of copper in the world even now. So I think copper is something, it's a metal that can create a sort of bridge between the pre-colonial period and now. And marking those marks of identity like it was done before, it's uh, a way of bringing uh, identity and knowledge that uh, has been you know, uh, erased through this idea of modernism, but it's really interesting now to think about how to project, uh, to project and how self in the future with uh, um, with this heritage and, and uh, all this knowledge that we've forgotten through uh, um, this imperialist uh, uh, way of uh, ruling and, and thinking. So, yeah. Um, so the, the Katanga region via its minerals directly connected to the Manhattan Project, to the people of the uh, United States, and to the obliteration of urban environment and human societies in Japan. When I present photograph of a uh, mineral such as this image, uh, which is part of a work that I'm showing now in, in, in Documenta, I'm considering uh, these types of linkage, linkages from one environment, natural and human, to another, and showing that although the Congo might seem far away from the viewer's reality, historically and geographically, actually it is closer than it appears in the mirror. Consider a cell phone. Every cell phone contains uh, contain Colton. A major source of Colton is DRC. Much of it is mined artisanally and smuggled illegally. Colton helps to communicate with contacts and connect to the internet, but it is also connected to the civil war, uh, to the civil wars in Congo and neighboring country, where mineral smuggling founds malicious and leads to armed other threat of harm to local people, wildlife, or, or the environment. There have been two overlapping wars uh, of the Congo from 1997 uh, to, to, um, to 2002. Spillovers from ethnic conflict in Rwanda, countered by Uganda-backed rebels, all pressuring DRC forces, did we realize our cell phone is connect, uh, is connect us to this violence via the equivalent of blue diamond, what we might call blue cotton from Congo? Human rights violation, the outcome of armed conflict, particularly of children and women, have had a profound impact on the population. Nearly 44% uh, of women of women, and about 22% uh, of men have no income. People in Eastern Congo live lives on um, uh, uh, $32 per year per capita. 
and average. Poverty is manifested in malnutrition, uh, which uh, affects between uh, 30 and 50 percent of women and children. A total of 16 million people are found insecure, and it in, in, is in this context that you understand that people are tempted to make money by artisanal mining of valuable minerals, those not forced to flee their land or tempted to abandon their farms for a quick return. Consider how much the cotton is your farm is worth. Now, I turn to my ecology series. Here, I took uh, an interest in the artisanal miners who risk their lives reworking mine site in Katanga, far from the conflict of Eastern Congo, yet also striving to escape poverty. Some of these workers are on the contract to Chinese companies who have invested in Congo's mines and from whom they must also purchase the uh, rudimentary supplies. They live in tarpaulin uh, shelters with the frequently decorate, um, decorate with plastic posters, also brought from Chinese suppliers. These, post these posters evoke an uh, ideal world, glittering metropolises, tranquil paradises. This imagines utopia of the new millennium, I juxtapose with the harsh realities of the Congolese environment the natural environment as the context of social environment. This is the environment of the Congolese worker working. I'm gonna show you, um, finish this uh, presentation by present you, presenting you one of the uh, first video I did in 2006 uh, only on the mining. Uh, uh, I think it will expand more than my English, my poor English. Nous allons établir ensemble la justice sociale et assurer que chaque, chacun reçoive la juste rémunération de son travail. Pour cela, dans ce vaste chantier de 14 millions d'or, qui est notre pays, éclairé et guidé tous ceux qui œuvrent dans l'enthousiasme. C'est cette communauté de forts, de plein et de travail qui achèvera le plus sûrement d'unir tous les Congolais en une grande, seule et solide nation. Nous montrerons ainsi au monde, par nos actes, que nous sommes dignes de la confiance que le peuple a placée en nous et que de nombreux pays nous témoignent déjà.
1960 à 1965, une époque néfaste pour notre peuple. Et nous sommes obligés de reconnaître que l'anarchie, le chaos, le désordre, l'inconscience et l'incapacité régnaient en maître aux Haïts. Notre pays n'a pas seulement souffert à cause de l'impréparation politique, mais également et surtout suite à la convoitise de l'Ouest et de l'Est, les uns et les autres voulant avoir une influence déterminante sur nous afin d'être maîtres de nos importantes ressources naturelles. Les uns voulaient nous recoloniser économiquement, tandis que les autres voulaient nous dominer idéologiquement. Le Zahir, qui est passé d'un chaos indescriptible à un pays organisé et gouverné, a fini par reconnaître, à partir de sa malheureuse expérience, ses véritables amis.
pays a besoin de la paix. Il faut que ce monsieur vienne et on négocie, que l'on puisse trouver une solution paisible au problème de la crise du pouvoir. S'il négocie, on tout s'arrange à l'amitié, à l'amicable. Mais s'il ne négocie pas, nous serons obligés d'avancer. It's a great pleasure to introduce Shibankar Banerjee, a photographer, writer, educator, and environmental activist whose work has drawn international attention to the impact of climate change on human and non-human communities in the Arctic and the American West. 
He is the Lannan Foundation Endowed Chair and Professor of Art and Ecology at the University of New Mexico. Born in Barampur, India, near Kolkata, he grew up in a rural, tropical setting in Bengal, where he formed an early appreciation of land and ecology. After studying engineering in Kolkata, he moved to the US and earned master's degrees in physics and computer science at New Mexico State University. Taking up photography and traveling extensively throughout the Western US and Canada during the 1990s, he eventually left his scientific career in 2000 to pursue art full time. With support of the Seattle nonprofit Blue Earth Alliance, he undertook a 14 month photography project in Alaska, culminating in his first book, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Seasons of Life and Land in 2003. In addition to winning numerous awards, the book accompanied an exhibition of his photographs at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. This exhibition famously became an object of government censorship when his photographs were shown to US senators during congressional debates about oil drilling at the Arctic Refuge. In one of the more notorious cases of the culture wars in Washington, the Smithsonian bent to political pressure from pro-drilling forces and downsized his exhibition, stripping the show of its explanatory labels and moving it to an obscure gallery in the basement. Simply by revealing beauty and vitality at Anwar, Banerjee's work was a threat to oil interests. The exhibition was later shown in fuller form by the American Museum of Natural History in New York and several other museums. Since then, he has become a prominent public artist and spokesman for environmental justice and has returned to the Arctic several times to photograph the indigenous communities in Alaska, Canada, and Siberia. In 2012, after visiting appointments at Fordham University and the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, he published an edited volume titled Arctic Voices, Resistance at the Tipping Point containing 39 essays and testimonies by indigenous cultural activists, scientists, and writers, along with photographs and drawings by 16 artists. More recently, he has turned his attention to photographing the rainforest environment of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state, prompted by the so-called Paradise Fire in Olympic National Park the largest fire in recorded history in the western coastal temperate rainforests of the park. I could say much, much more, but I should just introduce him. Please welcome Shubankar Banerjee. May I get a little help with the, uh, oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank my dear friend, Alan, uh, not just for that lovely introduction, kind introduction, and bring me, bringing me here, for which I am deeply humbled and grateful, but for bringing all of us together. Like this has been an incredible day, as most of you know who have been here all day long. So uh, a deep sense of gratitude. What uh, uh, I will give this talk, uh, not as an artist, but actually as a student uh, seeking knowledge. And by the end of the talk, I hope I can explain what that means. In 2011, uh, Alan mentioned Institute for Advanced Study. I wrote a, a small uh, letter to Professor Ivalan Boa, sitting right over there, about my interest in art as knowledge. I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, later that year, I spent the fall term at the Institute, uh, gave a talk, several talks there, in one of which Professor Boa uh, read that letter aloud the enti in its entirety. So I was very embarrassed. And looking back, I really can say I had no idea. But after all these years, I thought about that. Uh, and I still don't have an answer whether art is knowledge or not. But I will say something about art and knowledge. 
Uh, over the past 16 years, actually, it'll be hard to follow Sami's talk, but uh, there'll, be a, there'll be resonance. And one thing I should mention right up front, in one thing that Sami mentioned, that talking about Congo, he said it's geographically far, and then something else maybe regarding history. So the region I'm going to talk to you about has that resonance, that how do you bring places like the Arctic to our imagination, not as a faraway place, but a place that is very near. So over the past 16 years, I'll only read a little bit, then I'll just go into a regular uh, presentation. A, six, a significant part of my work as a photographer, writer, activist, and scholar addressed and continue to address various social environmental concerns in Arctic Alaska. Conservation of land, water, and biological diversity, indigenous environmental justice, oil and gas development, and climate change. On Monday, I visited Washington, D.C. There, my activist colleagues at the Alaska Wilderness League briefed me on the latest Arctic happenings, Arctic drilling decisions that a month ago we anticipated will likely be made later in the fall of this year, instead now looks like might be made in the next week or two, and none of which has been really reported in national press or media yet. Emboldened by President Trump's extreme anti-environmental agenda, which some of which Alan alluded to at the very beginning of the day, which includes, in my case, in the case of the Arctic, which includes the push to expand significantly domestic extraction of fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal, combined with the fact that there has been some recent large onshore oil and, dis oil and gas discoveries in Arctic Alaska, including earlier this year in January, uh, the US Congress is moving very rapidly to open up new areas in the American Arctic and also overturn some of the significant offshore restrictions that were put in place by President Obama just before he left office. Even though President Obama maintained a, maintained a strong offshore pro-oil Arctic policy during most of his eight years of presidency. This is the latest uh, map, as you can see from the bottom. It was actually produced just last month of oil and gas leases on Alaska's Arctic. This is a map that is what we would call a map that is kind of highlighting a process of current colonization of the Arctic, an expansion of that process. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but it's essentially showing all the different set sold federal and state lease sales, active state lease sales, active federal lease sales all over the place. But the land I'll focus on a little bit is to that right, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But before that, so these are some of the new infrastructures that are coming up. And several of them actually were discovered during the Obama years but one of which, Willow, which is the latest discovery, which just happened in January. So these are very, very new, some of which I wasn't even aware of, but learned uh, on Monday. So now I'll actually, that is just a brief uh, political background of the geography that I'll share a little bit with you about. But this talk, however, will focus on arts uh, role in amplifying environmental justice. But, uh, and I've been thinking about this particular line of inquiry since the beginning of this year. Uh, it is a work in progress, uh, but like I said, I'm giving this talk as a student. I joined, as Alan mentioned, after 16 years of being independent, finally I joined uh, the University of Alaska last August, purely, really, for survival reasons, because I'd left the commercial art world, I'd left everything that had to do anything about bringing income. So after struggling for 16 years, I joined academia, finding a refuge there. So uh, I'm teaching a class finally this semester, one class which is integrative ecology and social transformation. I'm not going to go into that. But it has been cross-listed with 11 different departments and have 40 students from 15 different departments, graduate students and senior undergrad. And then next week, we are organizing uh, 
a, a public, uh, fairly large public forum, Decolonizing Nature, Resistance, Resilience, Revitalization, which includes a four-day conference, three speakers from here, including Alan, uh, Rob Nixon, and, and McClintock will be there. The only reason I'm showing you this is think about someone who has no academic background in art or humanities. How does someone like that dare venture into such an interdisciplinary realm? And the answer lies in photography, or more specifically, uh, my life in photography of the last 16 years. And part of the reason I'm thinking about this, this is very, very uh, sort of a new thing I'm thinking about, is because I am living in a borderland state. And earlier we heard about borderlands between Mexico and New Mexico. I too, I, I too live in a borderland state. So I've been thinking about crossing borders, building bridges, not walls. And how can photography possibly get us there? So peripatetic photography, that's what I'm calling it. I mean, borrowing the term from, I guess, Socrates. But for me, a photograph is not merely an object on a wall that may induce pleasure or spark intrigue and other human emotions. But more importantly, it is a portal to activism and knowledge, collaborative social environmental activism, and interdisciplinary production of knowledge. So I'll situate this talk in a particular place. And then we'll go into the photography part of it. So we earlier saw a map that could be talked about, a map of colonization. And primarily, the role of map historically has been uh, played a significant role in the process of colonization. This particular map, however, is actually doing the act of decolonization. It's produced by the Guichin Steering Committee of, and the Guichin Nation is actually 15 villages in Arctic Alaska and two uh, territories in Arctic Canada, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. <coughs> and as you can see, this map is doing actually a few different things that I'll mention. It goes back to this idea of like expanded fields. So I'll, I'll bring up Alan's, uh, that phrase that he used in art historical context in a different context here. So it's bringing the biological into conversation with environmental justice. So it's the two overlaps you see of the uh, homeland of the caribou and the homeland of the Guichin practically overlap. So the idea of environmental justice is being expanded by the Guichin people by bringing the biological front and center in this map. But there is one other thing that I'll mention is, and the border, so-called the border is a purely a dotted line. So neither the Guichin nor the Caribou care about the bother, and they really don't. Fortunately, they can do this back and forth thing, which is not possible in the US-Mexico border as easily. But nevertheless, there is this cross-border thing going on. Uh, but one thing I'll point out, which I'll come back a little bit later, is that red area is the most debated public land in the US history and continues to be that way. And the debate has been about whether to open up that area to oil and gas or not. And the campaign to first create the place and then protect it has been going on for seven decades now. It's in a seventh decade. Uh, and I'll come back to the idea of seven decades later. And the oil part, uh, the debate about oil has been going on for now four decades. It also happens to be the most biologically diverse conservation area in the entire Arctic and has sustained to indigenous communities over many millennia. Uh, that's all I'll say. Now I'll launch into something else. Uh, so that's the caribou that the Guichin people are talking about. It's their migration, just a picture, nothing more than that. So here, the, these are all pregnant female caribous migrating on the left over mountains, on the right over the frozen river. That is all I'll say about art. Now what we'll do is, is launch into the journey of the images of migration and see where they go. Uh, but the idea that photographs move around is not nothing new. In fact, right here at this institution, at the Princeton University Art Museum, there was a major exhibition and a scholarly catalog published a few years ago 
called the itinerant languages of photography, the exhibition will in examine the movement of photographs. And that's what they did. But nevertheless, inquiries like this and some others, the focus is on the object, that the object moves around, the object takes on new meanings, the object, object does something to the target space, and so on and so forth. The f and how it picks up new meanings and whatnot over different spaces, across geographies, across time, across different archives, I have no interest in that. So what I'll share with you, my only interest is that the photograph merely becomes a guide to take me to a place. Once it arrives there, the photograph serves no function whatsoever. And the target space becomes a place to learn. So that's how I become a student. It begins with, and I'm going to go a little bit uh, fast and loose with, uh, there is no chronology here. It's just kind of jumbled together a few, few of these spa spaces that it has been and what happened. Uh, so this book was published in 2006 called American Earth, Environmental Writing Since Thoreau, edited by renowned uh, American environmental journalist and activist Bill McKibben. And the book is published by, and I should mention that by uh, Library of America, meaning this book will be in print for perpetuity, very important publication. So anyway, so the photograph was there. So that, then I'm curious about what this book is about. So I go in and find text, and so I'm sort of do, beginning to do something called eco-critical reading, which I will come back to a little bit later. So in his introduction, McEwen has a little text, which uh, I'll just highlight a couple of points there. I've sought to give a feel for how that writing, he's talking about American environmental writing, as the single most distinct, <coughs> distinctive contribution towards literature, and in this anthology, I've sought to give a feel for how that writing out of which emerged the first modern environmentalism evolved intellectually and artistically. It is not a correct statement. Modern American environmentalism did not originate in America. It originated in France, nor did it originate from writing, but it originated from art. But that's a separate issue. A bit later, uh, and only here did, meaning in America, and he's talked about witnessing environmental destruction, take place in a context of general affluence that made vigorous questioning possible, which immediately connected environmentalism with environmentalism of the affluent, that you needed to have certain level of affluence to be environmental. Poor people to be environmental was not possible. More and more of us were freed from the need to directly subdue the natural world in order to secure our dinner. So if you're trying to secure your, your dinner from a conservation over the land, forget it. It's not possible. So, so these are, so I go into places like this, then what do I do with that? So then it brings up the idea of politics of food. So then a simple, very simple juxtaposition, but there are three. So when something like this is shown here, let's say the migration of Caribou or the harvest of the images, I'm curious, this was at Dartmouth College. But a lot of the people that I have seen, and th this kind of installation has been done in different places, uh, seem to, at least North American audiences, seem to have expressed unease about the images on the right, but quite pleased by the images on the left. The tension is, of course, intended. Uh, but it, of course, is referring to our disconnection with food. Where does our food come from? And what do we do with that? So blood in meat is something we don't see anymore. Everything is wrapped in plastic. Uh, so from the politics of food, uh, I just want to go into that same sort of the biological and the uh, indigenous human rights. So in 2005, when it seemed like we are not going to win this debate at all, in Congress, it's, a, it's a basically we thought we would lose. So in a very desperate attempt, I worked with an uh, activist friend to design an ad. Uh, we had no money. But somehow, we had designed the ad, and then the conservation community came in. The ad was published full, full page in the New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today. Next month, to our great surprise, we won that again. In fact, we defeated each and every proposal 
by the Bush administration over an eight year period. I was basically nothing but an activist. But here, again, the bifurcation of the caribou, we used it. But on the right, primarily we talk about energy politics and, uh, and the biology. And on the left, primarily we talk about indigenous human rights. Very unusual for environmental uh, propaganda, if you call it. There is a history of that. In 1966, uh, David Brower and his colleagues at the Sierra Club launched what is now called the famous Grand Canyon battle ads, also in the New York Times. But there's a very difference between what was done there and what is done there. So environmental justice was a key part of the campaign that we launched on New York Times, which was not Brower's uh, priority. But uh, continuing on to the food thing, so this was a, a third text journal, Contemporary Art and Politics of Ecology. The image appears there, but I'm just taking you where the image takes me. But anyway, I wrote something, also an essay in there about politics of food or access to food. But something very unique happened in this campaign that I realized is that the Guichin people who are fighting to protect that red, deep red area from oil and gas development, because that is where the caribou goes to give birth. That's the calving ground. So they call it Itsiguatsan Gwandai Goodlit, the sacred place where life begins. Uh, but that is not the Guichin traditional homeland. It is the homeland of the Inupiat people. The Guichin do not travel there. They do not even walk there. Uh, they, uh, they, they do not inhabit the land and yet they are making a claim for its protection. In US, it's unheard of, almost. Because either you inhabit a place or you show some kind of a use. For them, there is no direct use. So it's a very indirect use through the uh, tenuous uh, connection to the caribou. Because the caribou gives birth and this and that. So what I call that, it's a right to food claim. That's what they're making. And they have been extremely effective in making this sort of a claim over a territory that they don't inhabit or even use directly. But it's not about just food. It's, uh, so Sarah James, uh, well-known uh, Guichin activist, care about not just what we eat, they're who we are, they're in our stories and songs and the whole way we see the world. Caribou are our life, without caribou we wouldn't exist. So suddenly we are entering the realm of uh, indigenous cosmology. And earlier today, uh, I think Ravi's talk, he mentioned that working with the fishing communities, he never heard the word nature. Something else is taking place here. The Guichin are not only using the word nature, they're using a much more fraught term called the wilderness, which has dispossessed, both nature and wilderness have dispossessed indigenous communities for a 150 year period, but the Guichin are now using those words specifically to advance a particular cause. So for example, Sarah James explicitly stated, I learned by living out in the wilderness, our natural world. I wrote a long text of interpretation on that. So there are different communities are actually, even though there is a movement to get away from the word nature, a lot of indigenous communities, both in the global north and the global south, are using the word nature or even more fraught terms like wilderness to advance their environmental justice claims. Uh, so anyway, so then there is a, a major human rights report the Guichin Nation published uh, called A Moral Choice for the United States, the Human Rights Implications for the Guichin of Drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Then again, the caribou shows up. But when it shows up in a document like this, I have the opportunity to then go in there, dig in there, and learn about indigenous cosmology and how that cosmology is then activated for cosmopolitics. And so this is an opportunity to become a student. So the, again, the photographs are merely guides, or it appears on other media, like their human rights website, which in steering committee. And just a, on a lighter note, Jonathan Solomon, he was a mentor to me, one of the greatest activists I've ever come across, along with Sarah James, during a major uh, gathering of all the Guichin 
nation on the Yukon River to discuss a major oil issue, after three or four speakers, he said, now let the real Indian speak, and handed me the talking stick. And everybody burst out laughing, looking at this skinny guy talking to the Indian nation. But then it comes into a academic space, a truly a groundbreaking book called the Alaska Native Reader History, Culture, Politics. Again, the image shows up there. And I was, most of the contributors are indigenous people from Alaska, scholars, artists, activists, writers, poets. Uh, and I was one of the few invited ones to write a piece. But what this book did for me was truly opened up my eyes like it never did before. It, uh, it gave the sense that indigenous people are fighting right now for various fights all over the country. And earlier today, Alan talked about uh, the history of environmental justice starting right about 1970s, but then he went and broadened it up to the global. And the uh, environmental justice movement in North America started way, way before that. Even the first grassroots environmental justice movement, according to uh, some historians, started right in Arctic Alaska by a, a handful of Inupiat people from one community called Point Hope, three scientists from University of Alaska, two of them were fired by the university for, that, for their involvement, and it just a two or three environmental activists stopped one of the largest nuclear project that would have wiped this Inupiat people of the face of the earth called Project Chariot that was late 1950s, successfully through very simple means like uh, uh, community radio and a community newspaper this community stopped Project Chariot. And that was, again, a, a tremendous case of unlikely alliance that I call the scientists, the activists, and, uh, and a handful of uh, environmentalists. So, but this book goes farther back even that. And what it shows that the native solidarity started in Alaska going back to the 1920s. And social rights were established in Alaska through native solidarity before even it got established in the lower 48. Alaska was not even a state yet. And voting rights were established in Alaska before even here for the marginalized communities. In all of those campaigns, there was a native uh, brotherhood fund, uh, brotherhood uh, something, and then there's a native sisterhood. From the very beginning, women played a very significant role. Elizabeth Peratrovich actually was the person who gave a passionate speech that led to the voting rights for the Native people in Alaska before, before voting rights were established in the lower 48 for the marginalized people. Then the image goes into a very unusual place, gender studies. And again, this was at Barnard College. I gave a talk and all of that. What does gender got to do with the Arctic? A lot, because the Arctic, we have Lower 48 people have come to know about the Arctic primarily through all these male, heroic, white explorers. So it gives me a chance to then go into something like gender and the Arctic and learn. So again, I become a student. So these are just interventions. And then Alan Braddock's book, A Keener Perception, and this book opened up my eye to a world that I knew nothing about, the idea of close reading or eco-criticism. So what I was doing with that Mekeben text is essentially an eco-critical reading. I would have never been able to do something like that unless I had come across a book like Allen's. And then Colonial Studies. So this is a book that just came out by TJ Demos last year, Decolonizing Nature, Contemporary Art and Politics of ecology. Uh, because this is in the poster, I should say something about this. So it's not just the caribou image. There are other images I've produced that have had a similar peripatetic life. But this particular one also, this whaling image, had a quite, a quite a bit of peripatetic life as well. In 2010, I founded this thing called Climate Storytellers the Dog. It's just a blog site. I have no skill of editing. I, I have also no really skill of writing, but I try. Uh, 
So we founded that. We had contributions from all over the world, one of whom is Inupiaq activist Rosemary Atwan Garwak. Single-handedly, really single-handedly, she raised the issue about impacts of health from oil and gas development on Alaska's North Slope. Repeatedly, she has been marginalized, tremendous uh, negative effect on her health, on her family, on her community, but she never stopped. The very first piece of writing I did after joining University of, Alaska, uh, University of New Mexico last year, beyond writing emails, a formal piece of writing, was a letter of support. And I'm extremely thrilled to say, next month, the Oberlin College will confer an honorary doctorate of humanities to Rosemary. Her work is being acknowledged at the uh, at the academic level. Because what she did, and my students are reading her legal testimony doing an eco-critical reading. Again, thanks to Alan for publishing that book. Now we have an understanding of what that might mean. The reason I did is long sort of a uh, disciplinary intersections uh, and activist uh, inter uh, places finally comes back to an essay I wrote, an academic essay called Long Environmentalism, which actually, let me see if I did that slide. Yep. So I was back, at, I was here at Princeton in 2015 for this conference, Conflict Shorelines, and there I gave a talk on that long environmentalism. So it goes back to that idea that environmentalism, when we think of it, it's not a week long thing, two week long thing, month long thing, but or not even years, but decades. So one of the criteria of long environmentalism is that it has to last at least 25 years because it's intergenerational. And it has a bunch of criteria that I set out, and another of which is unlikely alliances, where people from completely, who are traditional adversaries, could be adversaries, or uh, completely from different cultural, social, political backgrounds coming together to advance a particular cause of environmental justice. And there are other things about listening and all that. And then finally, this conference that I'm organizing. So I gave you a picture of how I can dare to organize something like that on the right is because photography led me to all these disciplinary places that became, for me, I became a student of what was going on. So that is all. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't show my I didn't show much of my art, but for another time. <laughs> Thank you, Subanka. Our final speaker today is Edgar Heap of Birds. I am honored to introduce him. Uh, he creates multidisciplinary forms of public art messages, large-scale drawings, acrylic paintings, prints, works in glass and monumental porcelain enamel on steel outdoor sculpture. Recently named a USA Ford Fellow, he is a distinguished alumnus of the University of Kansas where he received his BFA. He also has an MFA from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University and an honorary doctor of fine arts degree from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. His work has been exhibited by many major museums and galleries including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and that's just in New York. Uh, he's been exhibited at so many museums, I won't list them all. A few of the prominent museums that have acquired his work include the Whitney, the Metropolitan, the British Museum, the Walker Art Center, the Denver Art Museum, and the Smithsonian Institution. Since 1988, he has been a professor of art and Native American studies at the University of Oklahoma. He has also taught at Yale the Rhode Island School of Design, and the University of Cape Town, and has lectured on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, but there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> John, 
Just last month, he conducted sabbatical research with the Batak tribe in northern Sumatra and presented a solo exhibition in Singapore. He has received prestigious awards from the NEA, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and several other organizations. In 2005, he was commissioned by the Denver Art Museum to complete a large outdoor steel and porcelain sculpture titled Wheel, inspired by the traditional medicine wheel of the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. In 2007, he represented the Smithsonian Institution at the Venice Biennale with a public art project and blown glass works titled Most Serene Republics, memorializing 16 Native Americans who died during European tours of William Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. Throughout his career, he has produced work critically addressing indigenous history, land, and environmental relations. Please welcome Edgar Heap of Birds. That's That's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your attention and, and hanging in there. Uh, uh, today, I'll be speaking uh, with this project, uh, my lecture, Defend Sacred Mountains. <clears throat> and uh, as always, I I certainly want to uh, dedicate the talk today to indigenous women. And they've carried us so far, so, so very far. And I, I always want to pay homage to uh, women like Grace Big Bear here, the Cheyenne Nation. And I'll be talking about four sacred mountains <clears throat> principally. And it's actually going to be an exhibition touring project next year from Pitzer College and Touring America, looking for venues. Um, but I want to first, I guess, talk about um, uh, who will be defending the mountains and why do we defend the mountains. So I want to read a statement from a young Cheyenne woman, my nation. And it goes with this piece I did uh, in New York many years ago, I think in 82, uh, with group material. Um, in Brooklyn, it was called Preparing for War, this, this uh, word piece, about 20 feet across, about Colonel Custer. Many Cheyenne were killed during the fight. The air was full of smoke from gunfire, and it was almost impossible to flee because the bullets were flying everywhere. However, somehow, we ran and kept running to find a hiding place. As we ran, we could see the red fire of shots. We could hear, um, we got near a hill, and there we saw a deep, steep path where an old road used to be. There was red grass along the path, and although the ponies had eaten some of it, it was still high enough for, for us to hide. In this grass, we lay flat, our hearts beating fast, and we were afraid to move. It was now broad daylight, and it frightened us to listen to the noise and cries of the wounded. When the noise seemed to quiet down, we believed the battle was about to end, and we raised our heads high enough to see what was going on. We saw a dark figure lying near a hill, and later we learned it was the body of a shine woman and child. The woman's body had been cut open by the soldiers. Uh, that was a quote from Moving Behind, a 14-year-old survivor <clears throat> of the Washita Massacre, um, just about two hours west of where I live in western Oklahoma. Uh, that was on the November 27, 1868. Uh, Colonel Custer came with his army from Kansas uh, to massacre the Cheyenne Nation. Uh, a lot of this work that I'm doing as well uh, is uh, insistence. And I think that's what we have to have in many realms of our en endeavor is to insist to uh, uh, intervene. This is an uh, image at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida where the warriors were taken and imprisoned, uh, the Cheyenne Nation warriors, uh, my family as well. But I want to talk about them a bit and uh, show you. I went through there to the fort and actually insisted that I can offer prayers inside of the fort. And the fort was where they kept the survivors of the Washita Massacre, uh, the, the men, uh, the warriors, and the chiefs. Here's a photograph of the, of the warriors and chiefs when they were gathered together after they surrendered from the massacre. And instead of having peace, 
they were incarcerated. And I made another drawing as a young artist, actually here in, near, in Philadelphia, near here, uh, after grad school, and just showing uh, the issues of uh, the uh, language and how the language was really what imprisoned the native people. So the English came forward to be their language imposed upon them. But here the warriors are after they were uh, imprisoned and then they had died, some of them from the incarceration in terms of humidity and diet and changing of their environment. But they were held hostage actually uh, so that they could build three forts on the reservation and then they would uh, uh, dominate the tribe back in Oklahoma and make Oklahoma into a state. So Oklahoma was not to be a state. It was actually a, a native sanctuary for 38 nations. But that was, uh, w w was reneged upon. Now that Im imprisonment and that domination, uh, there were no laws, there were no charges, there were no judges, there was, there was no kind of due process. And that is an American tradition. So here we have Guantanamo and um, enemy combatants, so-called. Um, and here's a quote to determine POWs. Belligerents hold captured combatants and non-combatants of hostile powers in custody for a range of legitimate and illegitimate reasons. Prisoners of war are held to isolate them from enemy combatants still in the field to release and repatriate them in an orderly manner after hostilities, to demonstrate military victory, to punish them, to prosecute them for war crimes, to exploit them for their labor, to recruit or even constrict them for their own combatants, to collect military and political intelligence from them, and to indoctrinate them in new political or religious beliefs. So the Fort Marion prisoners suffered the same fate as the incarcerated gentlemen there in Guantanamo. Uh, Colonel Custer also engaged in, in human trafficking and he took women to the fort in Kansas. He kept one shine woman for three or four years and that was his sex slave. Later he dumped her back off in Western Oklahoma. So in Western Oklahoma we have a lot of uh, uh, citizens with blue eyes from that time. Uh, the, the warriors in prison in Florida they made artwork. Here's an example of one of their pieces. Uh, his name is Bear's Heart, the warrior. And he's showing you the army coming forward and uh, uh, moving across the prairie in this very, very uh, dominating straight line. Uh, the warrior that was in prison, there were two in the family, Moyuhan Haskus, which, which was convened uh, described as many magpies or heap of birds, hippo birds, the chief, one of the four chiefs of the Cheyenne Nation. And here in the picture, uh, the grandfather there in the center with the pipe, uh, it was his father, was chief heap of birds. And also, Hakiavi was also a prisoner of war, and uh, that was uh, heap of birds' nephew. And so, as you may have seen in some of the literature, my Cheyenne name is Hakiavi. So we have this great tradition of uh, leadership um, in, in that, that whole scheme of history. On the far left is my grandfather, Guy Heap of Birds. His son was Charles, many magpies, Heap of Birds. And, and I'm, I'm the, the grandson. So as I make prints, <coughs> I made a series of prints called Defending Sacred Mountains. And this is an example of the printmaking process as it starts out. But uh, I wanted to show this as a homage to Mo Yuhan Haskus, a uh, heap of birds, the chief that was in prison in Florida. And it's a very simple phrase in Cheyenne language, uh, Numshum, Numshum, grandfather. These are mono prints, all done uh, with uh, rag paper. They're 15 by 22 inches. And this is a whole series, there's about maybe I don't know, sets of 16, maybe four sets of 16, and they're called Dead Indian Stories. And so that's an example of uh, my editorial about what happened with the tribe and what continues to happen um, in terms of social justice. Uh, this is an interesting uh, piece I like to show as well. It uh, goes back in some ways to Guantanamo and where some of you may know that when they killed bin Laden, uh, his code name was Geronimo. 
So they called back to a situation room with Hillary Clinton and President Obama and, and said, uh, we want to inform you that Geronimo's dead and everybody cheered. So they gave the most hated terrorist in the world an Apache name. Uh, Sand Creek, Washita River, Sandy Hook. Uh, here, of course, we're looking at uh, death and massacre of young children. Uh, uh, Sandy Hook, of course, here near, near where we are in this room in Connecticut. But that we don't really lament the, the lives lost and the Cheyenne massacres. The one in the grade school near here was very well uh, mourned. And this piece um, done about the Washita massacre also, the Sand Creek, they happen to be uh, rivers or creeks where the tribe camped. And so the army was too weak to find them on the run, on the move. They waited until they camped to attack them. And again, the forts I mentioned, there are three forts still on the reservation. Uh, one became a federal penitentiary. And these three forts were built uh, to dominate the native people. And uh, we were never safe. I work also in the communities of my reservation with elders and youth, and uh, I work toward this idea, certainly, of environmental justice and the history of our environment and how we come forward from a ceremonial perspective to, to teach about this uh, circle, this, uh, this uh, hoop that we have. And I'll show you a detail. So this is uh, the medicine wheel, and it's the primary teaching tool, I think, for, for all life, really, from uh, this hemisphere, so that you'd have to have an awareness of the extremes of the sun to really be a, be a citizen of this hemisphere. You know, it's, it's in your interest to know that. And so that you would have to know, uh, on the, like the black on the, on the right top, uh, north, northeast, and that's the, the rising point of the longest day of the year, the solstice day. It would go around and then end in the, in the blue, uh, the northwest. So that would indicate <clears throat> the longest day of the year. And so really, it's more of an, of an X. It's not really this, this kind of shape. That's, that means nothing. Uh, it's, it's the X, because that shows you the extremes of the, of the sun. Now, the bottom two colors, the yellow and the red, uh, the sun rising um, sort of near Florida or somewhere in the southeast, Virginia seemingly, and coming forward around the earth and setting more toward California, Arizona, uh, the short day of the year. So within that, that parameter of uh, what we just saw with migration, certainly, um, the animals move with that sunshine so that the, the days that would come and go, the grasses would grow and die. You have to know when that's going to happen. Your animals will, will follow the grasses, and then you'll follow the animals. You know, so that all this goes together. So knowing um, the extremes of the sun is the medicine wheel. And that's where I taught the students as well as some elders. And that's our premise of all life is about that, that observation. Um, this piece is uh, a print I did uh, in Hawaii. I've been printing in Hawaii and I've been working in Hawaii with uh, uh, Hawaiian activists who are fighting the, the volcano that's, be, that's trying to become a telescope uh, on the island. But uh, this is what they say in their protest. Uh, we are land, land is us. Uh, what I want to show you now is Defending Sacred Mountains. And I work with uh, a series of texts on the wall. I make drawings all the time. Uh, even sometimes in my phone, I make, I make notations. And then later I'll come back to the studio and uh, put them on the wall as, as a list. Then after that, I'll go forward to a print shop in Santa Fe with Michael McCabe, Navajo printer, or uh, John Greco in LA, and Josephine Press in Santa Monica Boulevard, or recently in, in with uh, uh, a professor at the University of Hawaii in, in Manoa. And here's uh, Michael and myself. So the, the process is monoprinting, and it's a very, very elusive, uh, kind of a magical process. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the right of the screen is actually a plate of glass, clear glass, plexi. And so I'm going to write on that glass with clear liquid. And the clear liquid resists the ink. And so that the clear liquid, what I write with, becomes where the paper is revealed. 
And the very difficult part about that is in order for it to be a, a properly viewed text, it must be written backwards. So I have a clear piece of glass, I have clear liquid, and I'm writing backwards on the clear glass to make the words be as you see them. So all of them were produced the same way. And that's a drawing I would have about, about the message, uh, which I flip over backwards and put a light box underneath it, and then I can, I can trace the text uh, and use it with the clear, the clear liquid that's plate oil. And there's the, the plate. So I've written that back. I'm checking the, the text. And, and, uh, and I will be uh, certainly honest to say that I do have my share of misspellings, too, so, which are a big pain. Um, this is Bear Butte. And so I've, I've created a series of, of prints, uh, 16 pieces per site. There's four mountains. And I'm launching this as a touring exhibition, as I said, first at Pitzer College uh, in Los Angeles. And so I found uh, from being in Hawaii and actually being engaged with the protest movement and veterans from the protest poets that were, that were arrested in Hawaii, um, uh, Mauna Kea, uh, the telescope, they're trying to blow up the mountain and make a telescope. Um, so I just found that it was very important to, to support their efforts and to try to stop these uh, uh, desecrations of these mountains. But I found that there are, there are many of those sites in, Ameri in the Americas that are being assaulted. And so it's important for the work to reflect that battle. And so this is a site that's probably frequented by maybe, maybe 15 na nations, native nations, that come there. Cheyennes are there uh, in a big way to fast and to renew the earth. And that's the, the mountain they go to. It's near Sturgis, South Dakota. And so I created uh, 16 prints about how I felt about the mountain. And I've been there twice myself. And my uh, ceremony instructor, uh, Vernon Bullcoming, he leads um, uh, people there. He help, he's their instructor there if you want to fast there and, and, and worship. But the downside is that it's near Sturgis, as I said. So Sturgis has the site of the largest motorcycle rally in the world. You know. And they're there in, uh, in the summertime. And they're also there at the same uh, period of year where most of the people are going there to fast and make their ceremonial offerings at the same spot, just, just north of town there uh, in South Dakota. And their behavior, of course, is very, very uh, uh, insensitive, I guess, is, is an understatement. Uh, there's one of the events there. So, um, and so they're also building an, a shooting range near the site. Uh, there's taverns to be opened. Um, they're also trying to uh, do oil drilling, 28 wells nearby. And uh, so recently, the Cheyenne Nation uh, went there during a land sale and bought a large section of that land with our gaming revenues and bought the land back. But having someone there to actually protect it is very important. Uh, so the, um, this is one of the prints. Uh, some people talk about, uh, uh, as they do their recreational lives, they call it a holy event, you know, that they have a, they have a very uh, strong desire to have their bike rallies. Uh, so Bull Cumming is one of the, was my, my instructor in the ceremony, so he goes there to, to give care. And, and Bear Butte itself in Cheyenne uh, has a different name in a sense, and it's just called the hills where people are taught. So the hill will teach you if you go there. Another site is in Arizona just outside of Flagstaff. And it's a very sacred site for the Diné Navajo people. And it's uh, been under fire by tourism. And again, leisure activities like the biker bars. Uh, this time it's snowboarding and uh, skiing. And so at this mountain, you have the largest concentration of medicine plants for the Navajo Nation. 
And so the plants grow there in the snow and the, in the snow melt. But of course, now they've come with the, with the snowboarding uh, um, resort, and they're using the brown water, gray water, to make snow. They have snow making. So in a sense, the sewage water is now watering all the plants. And so it's, cre it's creating quite a disaster for ceremonial uh, observations and actions. Uh, so again, I start with all with, with you know these phrases, and it takes many months to get to this stage, of course. Um, but uh, I put them on the wall in my studio, and then I make the big sketch, like you, you saw backwards on the on the on the light table, and then I'll go to the print shop somewhere and and make the pieces. Uh, this is a headline, uh, I believe, in the New York Times um, about a protest by uh, Denali. Uh, a, na a young native leader, and there have been protest marches across New Mexico and Arizona to uh, protest this, this uh, ski lodge and snowboarding, and uh, these young, young people have marched across the whole two, na two states that encompass the, the Navajo Nation, so I'm really proud of their efforts, and it's just so great and uh, inspiring, uh, and that's a, that's a print about, about their walk that they, that they extend throughout those states. Here's a diagram of the ski run. Uh, so it's pretty much carved up that mountain. And, um, but the worst part, of course, is, is the snow making and, and the runoff of the, of, the, of the water that's been poisoned. Uh, you can still snow, you can skateboard on, snowboard on it, but you can't really, no, it's not safe to use for plants. And one of the leisure uh, citizens there. And of course the wastewater uh, violates, exploits the spirit. And the mountain is sacred, but I would challenge them to wash their churches with the water. They wouldn't like to do that. Uh, the other site, this, this, this is the third site, and this is uh, in, in uh, Wyoming. This is a really, uh, the correct uh, site name is, is Bear's House. And, uh, and uh, there was an encounter with, I believe, the Sioux Nation. One of the captains came forward and to address them in the 1800s. And he misunderstood what they said about the bear, you know, uh, that the bear was aggressive and, and so forth. But he misunderstood it, and he called it Devil's Tower. He made it a Devil's Tower. But it's where the bear lives that made the Big Dipper. You know. A little boy climbed up the, the magma field and made the Big Dipper with seven sisters that climbed up the tree and turned into stars. So a very, very nice poetic story of creation was reduced to a, a devilish place. And so even to this day, uh, Wyoming's tourism likes to keep the name because it's good for tourism because it seems more ominous, like it's a good place to go because it's a, it's a dangerous place to be. But it's a very solidly uh, used ceremonial spot in, in that area for about 15 or again, 20 tribes. And all these sites are fairly much magma uh, sources, so they're interior volcanic uh, spots. And so particularly for most of the Plains nations, um, they're certainly aware of the, how the earth is made and uh, the volcanoes and the interior magma in our earth comes forward and make a lot of the surface land that we're standing on right now. And so when they make a <clears throat> particular ceremony, like fasting and so forth, they'll put you on the rock. They won't put you on the dirt. Because the dirt is, is certainly the, the byproduct of organic, organic matter and whatnot. They want to put you on the rock that the earth was made from. And so they'll put you on this rock, they'll put you on Bear Butte, you know, and so forth. So it's very sacred. Uh, here are draw uh, drawings for that site. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Fire Cloud was the first uh, Native American uh, National Parks uh, superintendent, really wonderful Native leader. There she is. 
And you can find some of her oratory on, on YouTube and so forth. You can, you can find her lecturing. So it's, it's amazing to finally get somebody from a nation to actually su support running these parks. She's now in the Southwest, but she was coming from Wyoming. So here's uh, what's happening to uh, Bear's house. Um, again, tribes are coming there to make to worship, to renew the earth. There's even even they even they even had buried remains there. Tribes that come there to bury remains, and now it's a repelling site. It's a place to climb, uh, and they've asked the the, the climbers uh, to respect the the times of year when. The tribes go there to make their ceremony, um, but that hadn't really helped very much to be just respectful. Uh, they want to climb in the summers, uh, and particularly the, uh, the economic apparatus of the tourism companies that guide you on the tour. You know, they actually sued the government to let them climb, and they said that if it was a sacred mountain, then it was a misuse of religion in the government to let the Indians have their mountain time, that it was against the law to have religious consideration. And so, uh, but the, the, they struck that down, but the, the, the climbing companies sued the, the government for letting the, the tribes have some kind of uh, respect. And there are a couple of different routes to climb up this site. So you have the climbers making uh, spikes and, and pounding them into the rock. So it's sort of physically assaulting the sacred place and leaving them. They don't take them out. They leave them. So they keep making more and more of these poundings into the site. And there he is going up. And again, they, they talk about it's sacred to them to climb it. So they have parity with the tribe, supposedly. And of course, I find the, the uh, divine... Uh, situation being more like uh, just to be excited in the danger and so on, not really a religiously divine experience to climb that, that site. And there are, are prayer bundles tied all over, you know, so people come from sweat lodge ceremonies throughout the West and they would take the prayer bundles and leave them somewhere very prominent where they thought the spirit might, might address them and that bear's house is one of those sites. So there are bundles throughout, throughout the, the park, but then there's just the tourism going on at the same time. And so I, my, my other um, uh, recommendation is why don't we climb Mount Rushmore and put spikes in it? You know? And of course, it's very interesting that if you, if you, uh, you can go up this site, bear's house, put spikes in it, do whatever you want to do, if you touch Mount Rushmore, it's a federal offense. You go to prison. So you see whose religion or whose priorities are more significant. Uh, the last set of prints is about the Mauna Kea confrontation in Hawaii and how they're trying to uh, take this sacred mountain, uh, the largest mountain in the world, uh, under the ocean and above the ocean and making it into a, a, uh, another site for telescopes. And when you go to Mauna Kea, you might know that there's actually five other obsolete telescopes there already. So, so science becomes obsolete very quickly. And they want to make another obsolete telescope, but, which will later become useless. And there's uh, the volcano. I was in, I had a show in Maui, I'll show you in a minute uh, this year. And you can look back from the ocean and see all the islands in a row. And it was a, you could see Mauna Kea from many miles away. There's the exhibit we had. And it was a, a centennial celebration of national parks in America. Uh, kind of interesting fate. A lot of my work travels with fate, really. And I'd finished the work about Mauna Kea. And I submitted it to the jury. And they chose it to show it in, in Maui at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. Um, and I went there, and I gave talks to the docents and community people about s saving that mountain. And there's an example. There's a shot of the exhibition in Maui. They made kind of interesting little, I call it sort of a political ghetto in the, in the gallery. There was a, 
there was, there were three political pieces of work, mine being one, and they put us all together, you know, so, so one artist had made these, this uh, painting of the telescopes, and then another artist had photography of, on the, on the left here, of one of the protesters being uh, assaulted by the police. <laughs> And, and when I had this show and I had the opening and I talked, lo and behold, I was end up speaking to the chief of police for Maui uh, City. So, so he said, I should know more about my own culture, shouldn't I? I said, well, you might think about it. You know, but, and he, he, was, he was Hawaiian. He was a Hawaiian man. So that, through that, I was all together in the same gallery space. And here are the, um, the 16 prints. And I have an elder in, in uh, Oahu who helped me with language and there's some text in, in Hawaiian language. And, and I was back there again just about maybe six months ago. Uh, they invited me, the students at the University of Hawaii invited me back. And I was visiting artists there, and um, it was wonderful. And they invited me to go ahead and print with the art school. So I printed uh, a new set of prints about Native American gaming that I have not shown yet. But uh, I finished about 16 new prints there. Uh, so that uh, Mauna Kea, the, the mountain, the volcano, is six miles um, above, below, taller than Everest. And um, so TM, TMT is the, is the telescope, uh, 30 meter, I think it's 30 meter telescope, uh, money, science, and sacred. There's also uh, burials on that mountain as well. There's burials. Of, of ashes, human ashes on, on that mountain. And they're making it to where you can't go up there. You can't, you're not allowed, you know, to worship your ancestors' burial. Um, but I really enjoy the printmaking process of how the ghosting of the letter happens, you know, how it becomes a shadow. And all those things are, in some, in some case, out of my control. So I'm really there to receive what the print gives me, and, and even the spirit of making these, these prints. Although they're text-based, um, I'm really kind of at, at, I'm involved with the will of the materials, you know, the oil, the ink, also the humidity, the, the level of altitude on the earth. Um, all those things have a lot to do with how the print turns out. And I, and I, I learned to accept it, so I just, I'm very excited to see what it, how it comes out. It's not. It's not a dictate at all, and, and I like, you know, that honor, honoring kind of system. Uh, they hauled away the uh, protesters as they prayed and, and put them in, in jail. And this is another slogan that they, uh, the protesters used on some of their, their signs, and I think it's, it's very wonderful, um, as if all of us could conduct ourselves in this manner you know, that if your grandmother was over here, you know, grandpa was over here watching you, you know, you, you'd do things very differently probably, you know. So, so having your elders uh, conduct yourself as, if, as, as though the elders stand among you, uh, very important. So some of the ways the words come out with the free, the ease, and so on, all that's part of the process of uh, just revealing the text from the ink and the oil. And these are all 15 by 22. And as was stated by Alan a little bit ago, I was just recently in, in uh, um, Sumatra last week, two weeks ago, and I was living in a volcanic crater a big lake. So I've been involved with these volcanoes um, for a few years now. And there is a volcano, volcanic national park, and all the volcanoes have names as well in the Hawaiian Islands. Pele, of course, is the spirit of the volcano. Family of five, there are five principal volcanoes in that region. They're like, they're like, they call them a family of five, like they're all brothers and sisters. Uh, here are the, the, five, the five volcanoes. And of course, uh, uh, Ho is, is just in 
kind of generic phrase and for Native people, thank you. Uh, Ain't of the land. Aloha is a spirit. And this piece uh, is pretty simple and I think profound in that how they would discuss their sentiments. Um, so this, this is for to pray everyone together for our land, for all of us to pray together for our land, you know, in the Hawaiian language. And again, we are land, land is us. And this is Maui, another volcano spot. And my friends who live there. So it's for the people uh, and Native women that I give this talk today. Thank you. Okay, if we could have our last three speakers up front with Ann McClintock, that would be great. Um, some really um, interesting and thought-provoking material to discuss, so I look forward to this conversation quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned, our moderator is Ann McClintock, the A. Barton Hepburn Professor in the Program in Gender and Sexuality Studies the Princeton Environmental Institute and the Department of English. Her interdisciplinary transnational scholarship and creative work examines race, gender, and sexualities, imperialism and globalization, visual culture and mass media, and environmentalism and animal studies. She's published several books, including Imperial Leather, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in the Colonial Contest which is, uh, as many of you know, one of the truly formative works in post-colonial studies. So I look forward to this conversation. Anne, take it away. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for three truly inspiring and incredibly deeply moving presentations. So I'm sure many of you have questions. And I think the idea is to take three questions at a time and offer them to you for comments, answers, um, and then return again if we have time for more. So any questions? Questions or comments? Yes. other questions we can take at the same time or we can simply go straight Let, let's go straight to the panel let's go straight to the panel <laughs> you the elder well, I'm the elder is that what he said I, man. I got a seven year old daughter what are you talking about uh, I'm not sure what you mean about the 
about the listing or, or the inventory? Is that what you mean about the uh, decolonizing? You can tell me I'm wrong. I just noticed that your, your listing, your compiling of, of words and language seemed to me, you know, um, that has a long history as a way of, of you know, kind of colonial forms of inventory, um, information of, of inventory, even indigenous language and terms. Uh. No, no, I think my work, I, I don't see it, well, it's kind of presented on the wall that way, and I, I do have it, it does accumulate, but I see the pieces as sort of singular uh, prints, and, and each print has six words, and I limit myself to six words, and I have sort of this whole mental process of just thinking in those six, like Heap of Birds is three, so it's like two sets of my name in a way, and, um, and so I just use that as a, as, a, as a methodology, I guess, and... Um, Although I, I put them together, I like to have a large kind of impact of a wall of words. Uh, and, but I see them more as individual expressions, you know, and, I, and, I, and they're made individually. So, so I mean, I mean the, the, the inventory is in my studio to keep it straight as to what I got to do to go to this print shop, you know. But, uh, uh, and, and I show that once in a while, but not very much, the, whole, the wall, the preliminary wall. Um, but I'm really involved with that singular print activity uh, and so the alchemy that comes out of that process, and I don't know if that was very, uh, uh, you could see that in the, in the process, but it's very alchemical, you know, when you go, you don't know what you're going to get out of that process, and, but, I, but I have come to enjoy that as well. So, so for me, it's more or less the, the moment I paint that, we pull it off the press, and I look at it, you know, and I can alter it a bit, I can get in there and, and fuss with it a little bit, a tiny bit, but, but pretty much whatever it comes off as, is the experience, is the message, is the, the piece of work. So, so the, the big list isn't really very significant. I think your observation is absolutely true for what I've been trying to do. So both on the literary and the visual. So I very quickly alluded to how, let's say, the indigenous people are using uh, words and terms that are deeply uh, dispossessed them. So the word wilderness, when Sarah James is using, I learned by living out in the wilderness. So the very first thing about the Wilderness Act that was uh, passed in 1964, uh, the chief architect of that act, Howard Zunheiser, said, man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So you can't inhabit a wilderness, and here is, Sarah James saying, I learn by living out in the wilderness. So very clearly she's doing something clever, but it's actually more honest than that because she and I did an event together at Harvard uh, quite a few years ago, almost 13 years ago. And uh, uh, her friends from the Thoreau Center nearby at Concord came out and greeted her and met with her and all that. And then Sarah started telling me these stories, which is really bizarre story of she growing up in, out on the land, that's what she did until about 1960s when they took up the village life. And her father had a copy for some reason of uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden. So she was actually introduced to the idea of wildness or wilderness. I mean, Thoreau actually used wildness, not wilderness. But nevertheless, so the, these terms are being very consciously used the terms that have dispossessed them through the process of colonization, because the whole history of conservation in US has been very colonial process, very much a part of settler colonialism, is now being used by indigenous people to subvert that process. Uh, because in a way, her use of wilderness is actually very deliberate because that's the only form of legislative action that can stop uh, any kind of a industrial development. National park, national refuges, national monument does not. You can go drill, mine, or any amount you want in national parks and all these other places, but not in wilderness. So it's a very deliberate use of that. So similarly, back, into my, back to my uh, visual approach, absolutely. So the language of aerial photography is used for two different, at least two primary purposes of very colonial. One is military, because military, uh, it's a very military perspective. The other is geological, 
So geologists look at the land from the air and scope it out, which is precisely how you go get your oil or coal or whatever you want. So yes, I am indeed using the visual language of processes of colonization to then do something else to bring the biology and the indigenous rights. So in a way, and maybe I'm learning from my friends in the indigenous communities that we are kind of using these uh, structures and processes to then uh, activate something else, the process of decolonization. Yeah, so your observation is very pertinent too. Yeah. Yeah, um, for me it's, um, I think uh, I started by making drawings and making cartoons with friends and, uh, um, and we came out to, it's because when I was studying at, uh, at a primary school, even at a secondary school, it was in a Catholic uh, school and I was uh, really um, interested by um, comic books, but, uh, but all those comic books were coming from Belgium. So, um, and, and they were only white in those, uh, you know, um, comic books. Uh, and with friends, we started to think that how can we, we couldn't, uh, I mean, identify ourselves in those comic books. And then we started to think how we can start to work on our, our own history, our, our own environment in a way. And um, and we started to uh, draw and try to create a story that was going around us. And, and this is the way also how I came to photography, because uh, there were not a lot of documentation on, on buildings, landscapes in, 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 in my country that I could find via, um, I mean, uh, press magazines or something like that. And, and it was during a crisis period, so uh, we couldn't print anything or found magazines that could uh, give us a lot of information. So I started myself to do photography in order to just uh, um, document the city and uh, other places and then to reproduce it in my, my comic books. And, and at the end of uh, uh, my school at university, uh, I met this di director of the French Institute and I started to work with him because uh, that way I could find money to produce my own work in, in a way to, to, um, to buy films for my camera and, and, and to do my own work. And uh, for him what was interesting is to do this kind of documentation of the uh, colonial heritage which I've never, uh, as I said, learned when I was at school at all. So for me this building was part of you know, uh, the reality without knowing really what, how it happened to be the city and what discrimination was behind and exploitation and all, 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 all this uh, uh, history. So when I discover ICAS, it's kind of uh, something that um, in a way um, shows me uh, the other side because uh, as I was saying, during the dictatorial period, it was just, yes, Belgians are bad, white men are bad, but it's not enough. There are, there are a lot of things behind, you know, in a way, it's not just to, to, uh, to, um, to start a story f from 60. I mean, uh, we, are, we know people were coming from 60 and, and, uh, and the post-colonial post period at all. So this is a kind of construction that, in a way, uh, Mobutu was creating and mixing with, uh, even when he was saying, uh, he was um, giving this idea of uh, retour à l'authenticité, you know, return to authenticity. It was a kind of construction between um, communism way of thinking and also uh, bringing also this kind of um, local or traditional way of uh, being, but it's, it's a construction in a way. So, I mean, my work, uh, um, when I discovered archives, I started to realize the propaganda that was behind those I images and archives and, and, and the way that, you know, the, the discrimination was between, uh, I mean, even the city that it was created, it wasn't created at all for uh, local people. It was mainly created for the white people but also for exploitation purpose. And so people, um, I mean, the local people were there as workers and, and that all, and, and, and it was planned like this. Uh, I didn't show many works, but uh, uh, I started, in a way, through archives to understand uh, the idea behind the city in, in itself. And as I say, uh, Congo started in 80, 85. Before that, it was communities uh, living around, and we have a lot of communities uh, that are 
in a way separated because of the, those boundaries that have been created uh, since uh, in 8085. So, mm -hmm. and I found a kind of, for me, this uh, way of working with archives is about to create also a kind of bridge with the past because, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the colonial period is, is a kind of invention and, and how to, uh, to get into the contact with what happened before uh, because we know that sciences and, and all the stuff that have been created during the colonial period created another story that it's not longer, I mean, it's something corrupted in a way. So, um, and that's why even in the work that I show when I'm working with copper and, and, and those clarifications as a traces of ancient uh, knowledge and, uh, and bringing it out into a modern way of thinking or, or contemporary way of, it's, uh, it's part of a process of how to create new references and not only uh, uh, avoiding the colonial uh, history because it's part of also of uh, the alienation that uh, I mean communities are uh, going through. Uh, so, uh, but it's really important to to work and to criticize and 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 then to try to create new 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 meaning through references that we can create ourselves. So, this is way of. Um, it's not really about decolonization in a way, but how to exist. In, Hello. Your video piece memoir that you showed at the end yeah. to be just amazing. Thank you. Just mm. incredible um, art piece about what you're doing. And I and I just want to know are you have you done other uh, pieces, collaboration, or with a dancer or continue to do that? Um, not all. I've done a lot of uh, work as. Uh, my colleague, I mean, photography brings me to found, to to uh, to be and to collaborate with other many people and many uh, artists or uh, scientific and uh, anthropologists, uh, ethnographers, just in order to understand more, but also to create new meanings in a way. So. Uh, like now I have uh, a piece which is also a video, it's shown at Documenta in Athens, where I worked also with a writer from Congo, it's now based in Austria. So, uh, and we worked together on a piece where, where we uh, reinterpreting a kind of essay by uh, one of the Congolese um, philosopher world known who was teaching at Duke University, is now retired. Uh, Valentin Yves Mudimbe, so we just go through his uh, essays and we put it in, in, a, in a new video that I'm, I'm showing in the documentary now. Yeah, um, I guess like one thing I see between the three of you is there's like a real urgency to kind of reveal the injustices of a specific site and it seems like they really can't wait until tomorrow to like reach the right person in a way, so I guess I have a question about audience, whereas um, how important is a contemporary art audience for you? And who do you see the ideal um, audience to, be, to get this message across? Whether it's revealing, uh, um, changing the morality of the masses, or finding uh, like a one influential person that really has power to change these issues? <laughs> well, I do a lot of public art, you know, too. That's what the, this card is, is a permanent set of 12 signs in Vancouver at University of British Columbia. And they're permanently in the ground. There's four at Pitzer College, and uh, there's, there's 12 at Anchorage right now in front of the museum. And they always um, say, like, An Alaska backwards. Today your host is, is uh, uh, Athabascan, or, you know, has 12 nations of all the, all the uh, Alaskan tribes. And... Um, and I continue to make those. They're called native hosts. Um, so that, and I'm trying to turn the, the state around backwards to see their past in a different way. So I turn the word around, you know. And so I'm doing a lot of public art projects all the time and a lot of prints, as I said before. But uh, the public art tries to get to the core of, uh, in some ways, the media and then become 
sometimes they're, they're thought to be provocative or inflammatory, and I've done more aggressive things too in, in Europe and elsewhere. So I, I don't mind being inflammatory and uh, making people angry, you know. And if you do that, then you become newsworthy, then you become a news story. I've been on like Five Alive News in San Francisco, you know, and they, my, my piece made them all angry. But then they end up saying the piece on TV, you know, which is wonderful. They, they actually do your work for you, you know. Uh, I had a piece in the New York Post, too. Like, so everyone in, in, on the subway saw the piece that day, you know, like how many millions of people. But it's about that kind of issue of getting it discussed, not really a big change or looking for that one person, but getting it in, in, the, in the mix, getting it to become like gossip, you know, uh, to be relayed through a story, uh, and to get the Native American position uh, considered, you know, and sovereignty. And that's why I'm doing this whole project about sacred mountains. Uh, people don't know about that snow. They don't know about all these things. And so I get it out there, and it becomes, it becomes uh, newsworthy, and it becomes discussed. So it's about getting those issues on the table, I guess, you know, too. And then, of course, uh, that's, that's one tactic. But, of, of course, um, thinking about the work in general, the main uh, presence of the work is to honor those tribes. You know? I have a sign uh, right next to the, to the bus shelter, and it's heated bus shelter in Anchorage, Alaska. It's, it's there right now, and it's cold there right now. You know? There's someone sleeping in that bus shelter right now. And so I found out who was the most populated uh, tribe on the street. I kind of got a, got a canvas of that. And I put their, their sign right by the bus shelter. So when that person wakes up in the morning today, he'll see or she'll see that sign with their tribe there. So, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do always is just to honor those, those spirits, make that first offering, you know, always, and, and, and be humble. You know, it's not like a big art star thing at all. It's, it's like the humility is like when, you're, when your grandma's watching you. You're not going to act up, right? You're going you're gonna to act right. So, so that's how we, I, I always try to carry it, is just to, just to have that honor. So I guess uh, your question about who the audience is, and for me it has operated at many, many uh, levels, as you can see. I mean, there is, yes, there is the art audience, of course, as an artist, yes, I want to see the work at the Sydney Biennale or other art museums that's happening, but that's not that hugely important to me, and increasingly it has become less and less important for whatever reason that I've become maybe more of an activist and possibly trying to seek knowledge. Uh, that said, uh, so you saw even things like New York Times ad, so an activist ad, that same image to me uh, is just as meaningful as the work being thrown at a Biennale or something. But, um, the main, as I'm doing this, it's a conscious effort, is to think about not so much like at least raise awareness and change perceptions. I think perception is this, because fighting fights will always be fighting fights. That's an ongoing process. There is no such thing as winning something. Um, is that with regard to the Arctic work, because I only <laughs> showed a, just one picture from the Arctic, but the Arctic work, the primary, Intent was because the Arctic is thought of as a faraway place removed from our daily lives. And also the indigenous people have been primarily invisible from even the environmentalist discourse for largely speaking. And as Rob Nixon so beautifully articulated in his Slow Violence book, it's about things that are far away, we don't see what is slow violence, and things that happen over a period of time. So uh, over the years, what has happened is that the work has helped people think about the Arctic not as a far north, but as a near north. In fact, one of the essays that historian Carl Jacobi, a dear friend at Columbia University, wrote about the work, his title of his essay was The Near North. So I think more than anything else, thinking about the Arctic as just uh, not a faraway place. That said, in my other works, which I didn't get into, Alan only alluded to, is again, is this changing of perception, is the second project I did, did was basically just walked around my own home for five years in a five mile radius, that's all. 
and called Where I Live, I Hope to Know. And the curator of that show, who is now the chief curator at the Portland Museum of Art, she's a fourth generation New Mexicans. And when she came to look at the work, she said, wow, <laughs> I didn't quite think about New Mexico this way. It was something very mundane work. Uh, and the Pacific Northwest work that Alan alluded to that I did was the same thing where I lived. So for me, the Arctic work is kind of an anomaly in a way, but it's the only one that I keep going back to because of its political uh, situation. It's threatened again and again, but most of the other works have been about the local. But even within the local, how do we rethink where we are? Um, for me, uh, I think as I said before, we started with friends, uh, actually, and trying to create our own uh, stories uh, and to communicate between us. And we started also to do this kind of uh, open, uh, open doors. So we were inviting friends to come to see what we were doing. And, uh, but the thing is, we couldn't find uh, money to produce. You know, uh, so um, I think um, art is part of uh, a process where what is really interesting is to have a kind of freedom of expression and to have also a space of expression in, in itself, you know. And if you follow up a bit the uh, story of Congo uh, since the independence, oh, we've never had a kind of freedom at all. Uh, we went through a dictatorial period and then after that it's always wars and wars and wars until now. So, and people have lost a kind of you know trust in the in the, in the politicians and, and uh, all the the, the, the um, uh, economical structure you know government and all, all this stuff. So um, for me, what what is really interesting in what I'm doing because I've started even since 2008. Uh, I started to organize a, a biennale in Lubumbashi with friends, and we're running a biennale each year, two years. And uh, we've opened also an, an art center and where we try also to, uh, to, um, to help young artists and also to uh, work with them together. So, um, I, I, and also this work that I'm working on, on uh, archives and history and the past and the present, I, I came to, the, uh, to the, this idea that it's really important to work with uh, the, the individual is, I mean, the man, the human is the, the one that I can believe than the, the, the nation in a way, because, uh, yeah, since the colonial till now, nothing happened in a way that I can be uh, kind of fan of nation or, or something like that, you know. So, um, in a way, art helped me to do it, and I'm opening it also to community in a way, but it's mainly because of I, I trust in human being, and, and this is maybe the future that can, can happen in this chaos that we're going through in Congo. So it's not really this idea of going in art spaces and presenting. Of course, it helps to open doors and it give also, I mean, a founding so to, to meet people. But, I mean, there is a feedback in, in, in people that I, I trust in Congo, which are more important than, and, and that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing in a way. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether it's a question or, or an observation or an appreciation. I, I felt um, one of the things that came through very strongly in each of these presentations was uh, the movement of memory through alternative visions of environmental time. And I was thinking as, as I was uh, watching this work and listening to your of something that Leanne Simpson said about us being locked in a kind of catastrophic extractivist time, the idea of resource-driven, profit-driven, immediate uh, uh, extractivist <coughs> relationship to the environment. And I was thinking, Sammy, of the way that the, you have these immense um, infrastructural skeletons uh, of history and the, and the mining mountains, and the way, particularly in memoir, um, the, the moving body animates the past. So what looked like static relics suddenly take on a life through that body. And, and history is incorporated into, into the present. So you have that longer historical arc. And then uh, if, you, if you prefer, I, I was thinking of 
of volcanic time and sacred time and the relation between the, the rock, the present rock, and the origins of soil. Uh, much, much wider loop. And then, and then what, one thing that you were saying, Samantha, uh, about seasonal time and even when the caribou are absent and outside of territory, they are still present. And that loop, again, it, it, I mean, there are all these different ways in which I think you're, you're prompting us to think outside of the, the dominant time frame that, that, that press in on us from a kind of a neoliberal extractivist mindset. So I, you know, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that aspect of all the work. Yeah, well, I went, that's great what you said. And I, I, I guess I'll just, just try to disclose that I think a lot of the the ceremonial leaders that I know, you know, they're, they're, they're always, it's, it strikes me, they're always so incredibly uh, grateful. You know, whenever we sit together, you know, start the fire, they all, they're really grateful. And they almost think, they have such thanks, that all, all those, in that moment when it begins, you know. And I, and I thought about that, I think, many, many times. And, and then, of course, as you get older, you start seeing the, the finite nature of everything and, and how short it all is. But the tribe, um, I have to say that they, I think they're aware of what's coming, you know, and it's not about saving any kind of like ozone or whatever. Or, and, I, and I think it's always funny when they say save the earth and, and the earth doesn't even need, need saving. I mean, the earth, earth can get as hot as hell and burn up. It's still spin and be happy. It's like not, it's not, we, we, get, we get vanquished. The earth don't care about that. It's not, you know, don't care about that. So when people say save something, they mean save me. They say save me, please. But, but uh but in that in that day to come, when that Earth does move closer to the sun, or something happens, and, and we're not here to talk about anything anymore, nothing, no matter what your values are, you know, um, leading up to that point, it would just be great if if humans could do something, you know, in homage of this planet, you know, not not to save themselves, and not to make money or save money or whatever, get a new church or anything. This is just just to do to, to be grateful, I guess, and to be be humble and to uh, engage this planet, you know, and uh, like every day you get up every day, and, and and just be thankful you got that day. Of course, it sounds kind of trite, but but the, but the tribes have always been very thankful in the sense like it's it's gonna it's finite, it's it's not forever. It's not gonna be forever. An economy forever or environment forever. It's not gonna be, and they know it's not gonna be, and they knew that ten thousand years ago. And so they're just, they're just very grateful all the time. And, and I think they seem to make some kind of adjustment to, to offer good things because there is a limit, you know, and it's not about saving anybody. It's just what's your contribution going to be? Who can make that? Let's make that now, like right now, you know, and tomorrow on the next day. And, and, uh, and so that's what, I, that's what I think that comes to, that, that ancient rock and, it just goes back into that rock that's going to come back. It's flowing right now in Hawaii, like the, you know that, that oh, I was going to the sea to right now, this moment, and and so there's that continuum, but there is a there's going to be a limit to to our our awareness of that too. So. Thank you, Rob. For uh, it's it means a lot coming from you. Uh, the 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 temporal time, like being there, there's a lot of different. Uh, things that happened, and I can mention at least one or two. One of the, um, that then later I started thinking about, the idea of time, or slow time. Um, it actually started with a very simple thing. Robert Thompson, who is in Upia, very close friend now, uh, we would travel, and the first thing he observed, he said, you are moving too fast, you will die. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, he said I mean it literally, you are going to die because you don't die from the outside cold, which was like 120 below zero wind chill, but uh, he said you will die from perspiring from within. That's how you die, that's how you get hypothermia, because you are already clothed fine, but if you move too fast, so you have to slow down. So he meant both metaphorically and, so I started learning about slowing down. So now speaking of speeding up, is there was a, uh, an Yupik elder, she passed away since, uh, who told this to her nephew, something called the earth is faster now. And what she was really referring to is that 
they would be able to predict the weather quite accurately. Not anymore. They can't predict even anything. I mean, people are falling through the uh, frozen river in ice, which I did and almost died in November. And so this idea of the Earth is faster now, which became the title of a book that Smithsonian published in 2002, The Earth is Faster Now, to anthropologists Igor Krupnik and the other person. It's a collected volume with contributions mainly by indigenous people from the Arctic. So there has been this great disruption of slow time that you brought up as it then intersects with this fast time, that everything is faster now. So what do we do? I mean, I don't have a, any, I'm not trying to uh, say anything, a solution or something, but I think people are thinking about how these two times are beginning to collide and what to do about that. But we have to slow down. I mean, hearing stories and slowing down was a big part of being in the Arctic. Do I have to say something? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just have a basic question. If you were not doing environmental activist art, would you just do art without a message, without, you know, just painting flowers? Would you, and could you? Well, yeah, I, well, I, you know, we had like, like 20 minutes to talk about stuff today, so we couldn't show, <laughs> show much work at all. But I, I, make, I make paintings, you know, I'm, I'm very active with my paintings. I had a show in Singapore, and it was, there were four new paintings, brand new paintings, you know, that are kind of about the earth, and there's about shapes and fish, abstract, uh, blues. Uh, and so, and, and, and some of the text I didn't show today, of course, but I have a lot of text prints about sensuality and relationships and jokes and secrets and you know so in my in my exhibitions I put all that together usually you know and some political things so yeah so you, you gotta for me you gotta do um, what 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 describes you you know a, a career isn't a slave to some kind of dogma either that's a mistake too and also to, to wallow in a bunch of negativity is bad I mean there's a lot of bad stories we had a lot of them today but but you know there's there's good things too and uh, you know so I, I don't want to live in that in that world of, uh, of all these crises you know so I don't I don't do that I, mean, I make a lot of funny things and uh, sexy things and then my paintings about the my life on the canyon on the reservation so I'm working on all that all the time and uh, but I, but I think, of course, the, the, the hammer is the, is the political stuff that needs to be pounded at home. And it's the one that's necessary. So I send that out first to do the job, you know, but, but I got other things to do <laughs> <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, uh, so this is an interesting question you asked. And in the desert work that I did, as it happens, it had nothing to do with the political thing. Like I said, the title was called Where I Live, I, have, I Hope to Know. And it's like nothing. And just so it happens, I'm in the middle of the project, is this oil and gas thing right there where I was living. There is this one Texan oil company is trying to drill. So anyway, so the local activists all got together and they said, well, we got to do a photo exhibition, submit your work and this and that, and I submitted. It was rejected. Everything that I submitted was rejected. They said, no, 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 you, your work will not help us at all. But, but and I was totally disappointed. These are friends who chose not to use anything. But that didn't stop the work. So it was, it, the purpose was different. So it was really trying to get to know building an ecological relationship with the place I'm in. And uh, similarly, the Pacific Northwest work really did not stop, start with any kind of a political intent. It was wh where I was living. But then it is caught up in a political moment. That's something else, not oil and gas. But so what would I do? I mean, I think I'm more like what Edgar is saying, is that what drives me primarily probably now, given where we are with our planet's ecological current moment, is I would rather spend my time as much as possible to address anything I can with my photographs, with my other interventions, as much as possible. But that's not the, all the things, I suppose. I think 
similar position, but I spend most of my time in that space, the political space. Um, for me, I think uh, that it's, it's um, that there is a confusion in, uh, uh, in the fact that one thing is uh, always how you receive um, biosensitivity, what is going around, and how you render it into the society, and how you connect with others through what you give into the society in a way. Um, and uh, art has been existed before even. And uh, actually, what is uh, what becomes politics is uh, it's the definition of what is art, what is contemporary art, and what is not. Because many of the, the, the object, African object that you can find in, in museums, those ethnographic objects, most of the time they're giving the function of those objects in the society, trying to explain the role of the object and not the aesthetic behind. We don't know the artist behind those objects. So, I mean, in, even in the pre-colonial period, there were artists existing, having this kind of sensitivity and rendering it. And I, even what, this is what I was saying about scarification. So it's, it's a politics behind, it's po politics in, in, in sense of police. So you have a city, or you have people around, you have a community behind, you know, who uh, uh, agree about the, the, the aesthetic and the meaning and creating the meaning behind those symbols or those, you, you know, this. But um, so now contemporary art or modern art has created a kind of, you know, uh, you have a kind of categorization of different types of art. And this is the place where now it's become politics in a way. So I'm not doing art in order to claim something, but I think what is becomes really uh, um, uh, confused in, in a country like Congo, it's like, you can do art, but with whom will you connect with? Because reference have been you know, shifted, and now we are in a kind of consumerism way of thinking, you know, and having references coming from outside all the time, most of the time. So even if you make something, you're not making for a kind of local society, you have to make it for outside. And I think I want to deepen that, uh, I have to say this, that, that certainly art, we're talking about art today and ecology, but I, I, I will go to the deepest point, and that is your family, that, that art is like about this big to me, you know, and, and your family, I know Sammy has a, has a five-year-old, Amy's got a six-year-old, oh, so we, showed, we shared pictures last night of our kids. And that's what you really do. I mean, for me, that's what, that's what I, that's my real job. <laughs> it's just being a father and a husband and, you know, son for my mother. And, and that's the real thing. And all the art and all these other things is, is, is a, I don't know how, what percentage that is, but it's, it's pretty small because, because what's really important is your, is your family and your, and your community, but, but how you act in that and try to nurture things inside of that. So, so that, that's where you kind of come to the art being, you can do a lot of things with the art because it's, it's, uh, it can reflect your own desire, but, uh, but it's also based on your own nuclear family together, you know. Yeah. Do we, should we have one, do you want one more? Yes, just one more, thank you. I'm not sure why you want to separate art from everything else because I think art is a, is, is a way of being and everything flows through a way of being. It's a way of thinking, it's a way of acting, it's a way of knowing the world. And the element of, there's no separation for me in terms of being an artist. And I'm constantly asked the question, are you an activist or an artist? And I don't know how to answer the question. Mm -hmm. It's not a category I created. But you know, do you think? All you don't think. I mean, it's <laughs> like that. So, be or you don't be. And I think I, I am to call it an artist, so it's up to you to call me an artist. But it's a certain way of, of, of being in the world. Would any of you care to respond to that? Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful yeah, way to end a remarkable <laughs> That's a good way to end. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.